All right. Um, this lecture is about terminology. And it's a little bit weird in the sense that it's weird to discuss terminology separately from everything else. But the thing with neuroscience and with science in general, but sometimes I feel like neuroscience is particularly uh, funny this way, there are lots of terms in all scientific texts. And if you try to look these terms up, as you read, it can quickly get exhausting. So what I thought we should do now is to look at some of the terms and to discuss them kind of in advance so that it's easier when you meet them unexpectedly, either when reading a textbook or especially later when we start reading papers, scientific papers. I also may occasionally use these terms in my speech. I don't particularly like them, but every now and then I may say them. So, okay, let's 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 go. So we start with the simplest term. This one I actually like. The brain. What is the brain? Because it's kind of important to, 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 to know, right? Which part of um, everything neural that we have is actually called a brain. So in case of humans and any vertebrates, that's actually easy. Whatever, whichever part, whatever is in the head, whatever is in the skull, inside the skull, all neural system that is in the skull, all neurons in the skull practically, are called the brain. So that's simple, right? And this is true for humans. This is true for vertebrates. Humans are also vertebrates. But what about invertebrates? Because they don't have a skull. And you know, like, all animals are divided into vertebrates and invertebrates, which is a stupid division in the sense that we only divide them that way because we are vertebrate, and so we're kind of very particular to our kind. And same goes with mammals, by the way. We are typically very attached to animals that are like us. In principle, from the biological point of view, dividing animals into vertebrates and invertebrates is kind of as silly as say saying that all humans are divided into two kingdoms those who are in red hook new york and those who are not <laughs> but you know humans like mammals so and vertebrates as well because we just happen to have a vertebrate column okay that was a tangent back to the brain thing so what is a brain, what would be called a brain, in case of an invertebrate. It depends actually whether we can even use this word, and it depends on whether this animal has a lot of neural tissue in its head. So if the animal, an invertebrate animal, is pretty smart, then probably does have lots of stuff in its head. One example may be a fly. A fly is actually reasonably smart, not as smart as a bee, because bees are incredibly smart. They have a language, they can count to five, they can recognize faces, bees can. Flies cannot, but still they are pretty smart for the size. And if you look at the nervous system, they actually have lots of stuff in their body as well, in their thorax. But the head is also full of neurons. And so it's kind of logical to call this part a brain as well, even though flies don't have a skull right but if you look at other animals some animals in some animals you will see a little bit more stuff in the head but not that much more so for example this thing on the left is a flatworm this is a diagram that shows all the uh, neurons in a flatworm and the head is up so this part is the head and you can see that it has more stuff in the head right however compared to the rest of their body it's not like ridiculously more and so typically for flatworms for example people don't use the word brain they use this thing they they call this place this part they call it cephalic ganglia cephalic ganglia i guess and cephalon is just a head and ganglia 
that will be the next word on the next slide actually Gang ganglia are just a bunch of like a clump of neural tissue so cephalic ganglia can be translated as a clump of neural tissue that's in the head and yeah that's a sliding scale basically I think in the past uh, at some point people actually didn't use the word brain for flies but now they do so it's really a matter of uh, fashion in some way and and tradition and by the way let's let's have a tangent here because I think it's a good tangent why do we have the brain why the brain is in our head Well, let's think about that. So, what is a head? Where does the head come from? Basically, if you're just a blobby blob, if you're a amorphous um, animal that moves in any direction equally well, there is no reason why one part of the body would have more uh, neural tissue in it than the other part but if you want to swim if you tend to swim or you tend to crawl or slither um, through the dirt between the stones maybe something like that as soon as you got an elongated shape you probably move one side like in one direction one end is probably will more often be your leading end just because it's pretty hard to be this animal that can move in both directions in this equally well and then once you have one ha one end of your body that always goes first into the environment then it's kind of logical if you think of it to put all sorts of equipment on this end because you know that's dangerous to to be in the environment it's dangerous to navigate it's dangerous to slither between the stones because who knows what awaits you on the other side of each stone so it kind of makes sense that you would put stuff in this front side stuff that can touch and stuff that can smell and stuff that can s taste the fluid if you're in the fluid and maybe some eyes if you got some eyes maybe some antenna if you got some antenna so all these sensory equipment will get concentrated on your front end and because sensory equipment needs some something to process this information right it's not enough to just collect information you need to process it you need to analyze it it kind of makes sense to have the analysis part or the hardware that comes with it also on the front end so this cephalization the process of head appearing and neural stuff centralizing in the head is quite normal is to be expected there are animals of course that are for any description that we have for anything that happens in biology there are lots of um, exceptions so there are animals that crawl the other way around or animals that don't use head to see or animals that eat with their head but don't think with it for one reason or another but for most animals it's kind of logical that the part that you eat with is the part that you crawl with is the part that you sense with and it's the part that you think with all right okay so let's go further we discussed the brain now what's next we actually already mentioned the word ganglia so ganglia and there is a paired word to that called nuclei and it's weird so both of these words are in plural one ganglia one one ganglion if you have one thingy it will be called a ganglion if you have lots of thingies of this type it's called ganglia in the same way one thingy would be called a nucleus lots of thingies are called nuclei what are they basically both are just collections of neurons collections of neural tissue and the difference when you use one word or the other is bizarre again if like <laughs> just think about that just how uh, species we are so if we're talking about neurons in the head of a vertebrate like you or me or dog or like a crow so if you work with a vertebrate and we're inside the head then we talk about nuclei so if a bunch of neurons work together sit together in the head of a frog or a crocodile 
or a cheetah, it would be called a nucleus. However, if a bunch of neurons sits outside of the head in a vertebrate, it would be called a ganglion. So whenever we have some part, something in our body, like near the spinal cord or near the heart, I don't know, it would be called a ganglion. And also in invertebrates, everything would be called a ganglion. So if you talk, if you found a bunch of neurons in a slug or a centipede, or like who are our friends a lobster they would be called so these collections of neurons will be called ganglia ganglia it has no sense whatsoever it's just the convention yep okay next so we've done ganglia and nuclei next nerves and bundles nerves and bundles are a little bit better so both basically means the same lots of connections lots of connections between neurons so it's like a wire or rather a collection of wires uh, lots of accents of neurons sending information from one part of the body to the other like these lines in the on the picture of a worm these black lines are these nerve bundles right nerves and generally the word bundle is used when you're inside the head and the word nerve is used when you're outside of the head so if you have a nerve in your um, arm it would be called a nerve but once this nerve like once any sort of nerve enters your head and continues traveling there it's usually called a bundle all right next central nervous system and peripheral nervous system so it's kind of easy uh, except kind of simple but maybe not really well so in case of a human or a dog or a cat or any other vertebrate central nervous system is the brain and the spinal cord we also have a spinal cord it's here on this picture so it sits inside it sits inside our vertebral column and it actually like it's not just a bunch of wires it actually does stuff we'll talk about that later there will be a lecture more than one i guess when we'll be talking about spinal cord so everything in the skull everything in the vertebrate column vertebral is it vertebral vertebral sorry oh God. so but everything our brain plus our spinal cord is called central nervous system everything outside of that is called peripheral nervous system it's on the periphery kind of makes sense right for invertebrates I'm not sure how you deal with that because you know people don't even know whether any species has a brain or not but I guess you can you use it metaphorically basically so in case of a fly I'm not sure whether people call this central stuff in the thorax whether in the chest sort of whether they call it central or peripheral nervous system but if we study flies we'll figure that out right definitely yeah whatever we can figure that out but at least be aware of these words okay now Greek and Latin so <laughs> lots of these words are not kind of native English are not of Germanic origin are not something that Anglo-Saxons would shout when they would you know run across Britain so lots of these words are of Latin or Greek origin just because fancy let's go fancy and because of that many of these words have weird plural forms so a nucleus again a bunch of neurons in the head has a plural of nuclei because it's Latin a tangent here I should have added a picture but a tangent there are three types of nuclei three types three ways we use the word nucleus one is this brain part but then there is also a nucleus in the cell which is entirely different right where the dna is stored and then atoms also have nuclei um at, and but that's that's again this entirely different scale right the nuclear bomb isn't actually made of these nuclei or nuclei that are in the cell nuclear bomb has like atoms of like nuclei of atoms interacting with each other 
end of tangent. Okay, nuclei, plural form. There is a part of the brain called calliculus, which is basically, which means a small hill, but for some reason it's not translated. English in general didn't translate most parts of the brain, most words, unlike German or Russian. Uh, English went with Latin, which means that there are lots of words that if translated may sound pr quite funny. So calliculus is just a small hill, but plural is calliculi. We'll talk about calliculi in uh, four or five weeks. There will be a topic when we'll return to this word. You don't have to remember it now. You don't have to know where it is. Just be aware that the grammar is weird. Gyrus, it's, you know, when you have this cortex thingy in the head, it has these folds and they're called gyri because again gyrus is singular latin and gyri is plural ganglion is greek and so the plural form is also different it's ganglia probably ganglia yeah oh, okay good i i left myself a note look at that this is a phonetic transcription ganglia that's weird but yeah larva larva you know little baby of a fly or of a lobster would be called a larva and actually so one larva is larva but many larva is larvae yeah <laughs> anyways yeah done Let's go further. Just be aware of weird grammar. Next, a whole bunch of words in vivo, ex vivo, in situ, and in vitro. What do they mean? Basically, of these four, four words, two are most important, in vivo and in vitro. And two others are kind of rarely used intermediate in vivo means in live something vivo you know it means live in latin i guess so in vivo means that it's happening in a live animal a recording potentially is in a live animal something is observed in a live animal in vitro is the opposite of that in the sense that in vitro means in a test tube or something so the animal is no longer alive you still have something to measure and the level of in vitro ness so to say may be different it may be a homogenized mixture of different chemicals that happens to include proteins and they do something or it can be part of a, a tissue that some cells from a tissue from a living tissue this is neuroscience so we are mostly we mostly care about brains so maybe part of the brain was cut out and it keeps living because we provide it with oxygen and some food like glucose and we can look at what the cells in this part of the brain do so all of that would be called in vitro and you can imagine that um, there are benefits and there are downsides to working in vitro so with some sort of preparation that's not a full animal and in vivo with a full animal i guess it could be if we were in the full class a good point to stop and make you think about like brainstorm from the common sense point of view what are the benefits and the downsides you know, let's do that. I, I mean, I will I will use my usual just think about that. So think about in what cases having a full animal is better and in what cases having some bunch of cells uh, living in a petri dish is better and the opposite. So in which cases what is bad about having a full animal and what is bad about having a petri dish. All right, let's assume you thought about that. 
basically the gist of it is that working with a full intact animal is hard right both it's very complex because everything is still there but also it's just technically hard uh, for example here we can see a rat and this rat has an implant and we can record from this rat I mean not we but somebody who made this so they can record from it but it's hard because uh, the rat has to carry this thing on its head and the thing should be well attached to the rat and the rat shouldn't be in distress because it would be unethical if the rat was suffering so every time there is an in vitro experiment people actually go into a really long justification for why they need a full animal and how can they ensure that the animal won't be suffering because we want to be ethical so it's hard but at the same time it's kind of excellent uh, is the best thing you could imagine because the entire brain is still connected to the entire animal and all the information is still coming in all the information is still coming out especially if the animal is freely behaves like is freely behaving while you're recording from it it's the best you can do in vitro everything is simpler right even if you cut the part of the brain and it's still alive of course you have to go into all these um, special preparations to make it live there you have to heat the water probably and you have to add oxygen and you have to add glucose but still you now have only this slice of a brain it doesn't move so you don't have these mechanical issues and it can sit there and you can study the cells so much better so but yeah the limitation is that of course it's no longer full brain and it's no longer active in the way that it's supposed to be active so in vivo and in vitro are on two polar sides of this scale but then there are kind of at least two stops that people do sometimes ex vivo means that it was alive just immediately before that so it didn't sit in your petri dish forever it's not a mixture of chemicals that you put in the petri dish it's not a cell that you grew in your petri dish it's something that you cut out of the animal and it kind of still carries some information about um, how everything is tuned that was relevant to this animal so you just excise it from the animal ex vivo and in situ means in place from Latin and it means that the context the surrounding tissue are the cells to which this cell this neural cell in our case are the cells to which this neural cell is connected to at least most of them are still alive so if you manage to record from the brain without breaking everything apart you can claim that even though it's no longer in vivo it is still in situ and people like these words I guess well I don't know why they like using Latin words for that I guess it's just you know terminology that has to be used but people kind of use them as hashtag or labels for their experiments in the sense that every time something is discovered in vitro people ask okay but is it can you show that in vitro I mean in vivo and then somebody says okay for the first time ever we show in vivo that it's also true does make sense this part got a little bit longer than I planned but okay let's go further so next next is well let's just read the words input outputs projections motor sensor visual optic auditory olfactory gustatory tactile vestibular so let's start with inputs outputs and projections from the very words you can figure out um, that we kind of start to think about the brain in sense of um, as a system that has parts that interact with each other so I show two pictures here you don't have to understand either of them but basically they show two types of pictures that you can see on the left we have those a diagram and you can see some parts of the brain it doesn't matter it does not matter which parts are these not for our lecture not for our discussion that we're having now but 
they are connected to each other in some ways and you can draw these connections so and not every part is connected to any other any other part sorry not every part is connected to every other part some parts are connected some are not right and also the connections are actually directed so it's not like sharing a table between two people no it's neurons from one part grow accents that talk to another part the connection back may exist or it may not exist and so just from the fact that it's organized like that we can guess that probably information travels between these parts kind of in the same direction first this part does something then it sends information to another part and so for every part of the brain we can think about inputs and that's where the information is coming from and then outputs and that's where the information is sent to projections is a funny word it's not like projector like uh, not the one that you use to uh, watch movies these projectors also exist of course and you can show movies to animals and stuff but in this case we're talking about physical connections so uh, a typical sentence would be this nucleus projects to the other nucleus or this part of the cortex projects to the spinal cord something like that and in this case projects basically means outputs as a verb except probably a little bit more morphologically so not well so we usually talk about projections when we talk to when we talk about actual things that you can see in the brain so projection is actually bundle of neural fibers that go from one nucleus to another okay so you can feel from these words that we are trying to go um, to do some reductionism here. So we try to, at least mentally at this point, think of the neural system as consisting of parts that talk to each other, which is, as it turns out, a quite productive approach. All right, then motor and sensory. Uh, these two words are antonyms. They have opposite meaning. And sensory is probably easier. So sensory means related to senses, right? So sensory means means related to senses, whatever information that's coming into the brain from the outer world. If in some something comes from the ears, if something comes from the eyes, these nerves would be called sensory nerves. Same like tactile stuff from the skin. Uh, motor is the opposite of that and usually so that's the outputs into the world and most uh, most often the main output from the brain the main way the brain affects the world the world is through movement and that's where the word motor comes from so motor neurons would be neurons that are connected to the muscles for example right so motor areas in the brain would be areas that are connected to them to muscles but not only not necessarily so any kind of output that results in action would also be called motor for example if a skunk sprays some victim well i guess i guess this is these are technically muscles because there are muscles that contract or whatever stinky pouch i don't know how it's called but yeah so this is still muscles but anyways if you okay let's see let's say some animal like a starfish releases acid to eat stuff because that's what starfishes do it would also the neurons that connect this type of behavior that that control this type of behavior that connect to the thingy that releases acid would also be called motor neurons but usually motor neurons motor nerves are those that are about muscles are about motion this makes sense all right visual optic auditory what do these words mean visual means about vision optic also about vision why we have two words no clear reason that's just weirdness so for for example we have visual cortex not optic cortex but we have optic nerves that connect 
the eye to the brain, not visual nerves. There is no rhyme and reason here. It is just a convention, annoying convention. But yeah, so visual and optic, at least when you read, it's easy. When you read, they basically mean the same. Some people claim that visual, I think, is more about processing and optic is more about the optics of the eye, but I don't think it works like that if you look at, like, if you look at actual names of the actual structures in the brain. This doesn't hold. Anyways, auditory is about audition listening. Olfactory is a little bit fancier, but that's about smell. And gustatory is potentially the fanciest of all, because no normal people use this word. It's about uh, gustation, it's about taste. I guess if you know Spanish, for example, French, it's probably easier, because I, I believe it's a Spanish, I mean, Latin word. So, yeah, tactile is about touch. Vestibular, we'll talk more about vestibular at some point, but that's about balance. All right? whole bunch of words. Next. Oh yeah, so this is just ridiculous. This is a ridiculous pair of words that have one letter, that differ in one letter, the first letter. Afference and efference. And they, these words are antonyms. They have opposite meanings. Afference is about sensory, about sensing the world around you. Inference is about action. So it's almost like sensory and motor, but a little bit more vague in the sense that for every part of the brain, there are afferents, so stuff that sends information to it, and efferents, so outputs. So inputs and outputs are often better words uh, to translate these, these pair. And this is just ridiculous. Like, who in them? What level of insanity is that to have two words with opposite meaning that are different in only one letter and are pronounced so similarly? So if you if English is not your native language, it's actually easier because then you probably rely on the uh, spelling and you know that they're different. But people uh, like Americans, typically American uh, high school students, for example, always confuse these two words because it's like affect and effect. This is the most unfortunate pair. The only pair that's even worse than that is hyperglycemy and hyperglycemy. So having too much sugar, glycemy, sorry, glycemy, hypoglycemy, hypoglycemic and hyperglycemic. Hypo means not enough, hyper means too much. Like in this case, people die if you make a mistake. One letter, insane. Here, people don't usually die, but you can either misunderstand what's written in the paper or you can write a paper in a way that will be misunderstood if you make a mistake here and you can kind of try to remember that if you think that like afference is about impression that the information makes on you so it's like affect affective emotional while efference is like effect um, influence on the world around you and usually neuroscientists try to pronounce that in an exaggerated way like afference and efference but honestly i hate these words so i don't recommend that you use them ever you will see them in the literature though next okay so we came to geography now this is a bunch of words that describe where things are and um uh, they're all fancy, they're all Latin, and the reason they exist is that, you know, you cannot really use words like left and right and up and down, because it all depends on how you hold your preparation, right? If you, like, started dissecting your fish from one side or from the other side, then left and right will change meaning depending on what's going on. Also, some animals are bendy. Some animals have, like, weird shapes to them. This fish is pretty linear and simplistic but if you think of a like basilisk or pegasus or a centaur so many animals have bands to their body and uh, when you have a band then describing <coughs> where things are becomes more complicated so we have a whole bunch of words 
the words are anterior and posterior so let's start with that oh I can can I draw I think I can draw okay oh yeah I can draw so anterior and posterior basically front and back anterior is in the front posterior is in the back done next dorsal it's like this one and ventral dorsal means back ventral means belly if the animal is like this fish and it's swimming like horizontally then dorsal is up and ventral is down but obviously if you have a snake climbing the a wall and the snake is now vertical or you have a giraffe giraffe is always vertical doesn't have to climb dorsal and ventral will be no longer up and down but they will be kind of back and belly okay and these are important words because they're used all the time and like these words are not stupid in the sense that if we somehow travel to an alternative universe where these wor words didn't exist we would have had to invent them from scratch because we need some special words to describe these coordinates kind of orientation relative uh, positioning of different parts of the body relative to each other that doesn't change when you rotate the body or when the larva grows into an adult or when the animal that used to be crawling starts walking upright and stuff like that okay so ventral is belly dorsal is back and then basically we have two coordinates now right so remember like three three dimensional species like creatures like you and me we're three dimensional so three dimensional species they have we need three co three coordinates three axes to describe where the things are and we have two already one is antero posterior axis that goes from the anterior end to the posterior end like in me it would go like that i guess <laughs> and the other one is belly back axis that is dorsal ventral axis we need a third one and the third one goes like sideways and this one is actually simpler because the center is called do i have it no we actually don't have it here let's go to the next one um so yeah the center is called medial it's like median like middle middle is the same word median medial middle medial means to the center and lateral means to the side okay three axes now okay now unfortunately it's not everything I mean, I mean it's not the end of it there are a few more words and one pair of words are rostral and caudal and uh, this is a picture i guess of a cat it's downloaded from the internet so looks like vaguely a cat but rostral and caudal you know for the fish it was called anterior and posterior he's called rostral and caudal it's almost the same thing almost the same thing in a fish it would actually be the same thing because fish has this nice shape it's shaped like a fish but if an animal is bendy like like a horse can I draw a horse with a mouse? Can I draw a mouse with a horse? Okay, that would be a horse. I like drawing on, on blackboards, but okay, this will be a dog horse, okay? So if you have a horse, um, it's happy. Uh, it would, uh, the horse has a bend to it, so the um, um, spinal cord would go like that, but then it would turn upside down. So and the axis the ventral dorsal axis would turn with the ventral cord uh with the spinal cord with the uh, vertebra uh, with the um, spinal column so this would be dorsal ah this would be dorsal this would be ventral this would be ventral yay um but the anterior posterior and the rostral caudal thing it goes like that so anterior posterior axis doesn't bend so here in the neck 
anterior things will also be ventral. So anterior posterior axis, anterior posterior won't bend. While dorsal caudal, can I change the color? I don't know how this thing works. Oh, I can. So anterior posterior uh, thing uh, doesn't uh, bend, but rostral caudal does. So rostral caudal axis will bend with the horse. Potentially it will bend here, but I'm not quite sure about that. And so this will be rostral. Eh? And this will be caudal. All right. In most cases, rostral is the same. Oh yeah, and we have another annoying word, cranial, which is basically means towards the head. So cranial usually means rostral, usually means anterior. The only well, I know two cases when the difference between these words will be important. None of them will actually happen in this course. One, if you're a horse surgeon, if you're a horse surgeon, then you have to really understand where is rostral in the horse and where is anterior. Okay. Another is if you are something like a dentist or like what sort of a doctor would it be? that works that reconstructs jaws does sort of surgery on reconstructive surgery on um uh, the people with trauma so if you work with things like a jaw because that's this this part is weird this is like a neck in a horse right because it's um head tail direction in the jaw goes like that but anterior posterior direction in the jaw goes like that so it's not like in a fish we are not horse surgeons, we are not jaw surgeons, so I showed all of that to you, but good, now you know it. Let's park it. All right, other words. There are still some words that are, so the next pair of words and the one after that, I actually used a lot and are annoying. Contralateral and ipsilateral. So this is to name things that are on the same side and things that are on different sides of the body. And contralateral means, okay, guess, is it same or different? Contra, contra, contrary, contrarian, contradiction, it's different, okay? So contralateral means different part of the body, which means that ipsilateral is the same. So you can use exclusion here to remember that. And these words happen all the time because there is this thing about the brain you might have heard of it but if you haven't now you will so which side of the brain we use when we control our right hand so this is my right hand which part of the brain do i use to control it actually the left the left hemisphere the left side of the brain there is a cross there why We'll talk a little bit about that. There is no good answer. Basically, it's an inefficiency that we have. It's, a, it's an inefficiency. The uh, uh, connections, are like, the accents would have been shorter if we didn't have to do that. But the brains are weird, and they're weird in some ways that are inefficient. And there are lots of connections between the hemispheres. So roughly to move your right hand you activate your left hemisphere but actually there are lots of connections when something on the left talks to something on the right and something on the right talks to something on the left but sometimes sometimes something on the right talks to something on the right so to give a name to that instead of always saying same side different side same side different side we always say contralateral ipsilateral contralateral ipsilateral so you would have like motor cortex projects to the contralateral um, motor nucleus Okay, these two words are actually used. Next, superior and inferior. That's also Latin, and it means higher and lower. It doesn't mean better and worse. So there are, for, for example, two parts in the brain, superior calliculus and inferior calliculus, and it's not the quality grade. Both are doing their job, different jobs, but just one of them, if you dissect the brain, one of them is slightly higher and one of them is slightly lower. So the one that's higher is called superior calliculus, the one that's lower is called inferior. Superficial. 
superficial means on the surface. Another word that's actually used by normal people, and when normal people use it, they mean shallow, like not deep, not honest. In our case, it just called it just means on the surface, literally. So superficial structure means that when you open the brain, you can see it either or you can like it's close to the surface of whatever organ, whatever part of the brain that you're working with. Not a judgment, not a judgmental word. All right. Good. OK, what's next? Oh, yeah, this is the horse story. I had a slide about rostral goes rostral bands anterior doesn't good all right the last section and the last section is about sections i didn't mean to say that <laughs> so the last uh, triad of words last three weird words and they used to name sections of the brain there are you know as there are three axes in three-dimensional world there are three orthogonal like right angled planes that you can draw and they're shown in this picture so you can of course when you have a brain you can of course slice it in oblique ways so you can do all sorts of slices right but three of them are kind of more meaningful because one of them is the plane of symmetry because we are roughly symmetrical right the heart is on the left so we're not completely symmetrical but largely we are and brain is largely symmetrical in humans there are some ways there are some asymmetries we'll talk about them in november but mostly symmetrical so and so you have this one plane that goes like that and is parallel to the plane of symmetry and then you have a horizontal plane and then you have this other one the third one so how do you call them the horizontal plane is called horizontal plane that's the most sane name of all three then the plane that kind of cuts your your face off is called coronal from the word corona We'll talk about that. Just a second. I have a slide. And the third one is called sagittal. So how to remember that? You have three words. One of them has sense. Horizontal. So horizontal is the one. Now you need to, if you need to remember, so you have this one that cuts the face off and you have this one that cuts um, the body into two symmetrical parts. Which one is which? So the coronal section is named after corona which is a latin for a crown and it's a stupid like not stupid i'm overusing this word it's a strange crown it's a crown it's not like the king from a from a uh, fairy tale kind of crown but a crown that greeks liked apparently or at least i'm not sure we should catch a historian of art and and ask them but kind of the statue of liberty this crown is kind of weird if you think of that goes like it doesn't go high like you know in the lord of the north it goes to the sides and i think that's because of these medieval pictures i'm not sure about that like, don't tell people who actually know stuff that i said that but i think it's because of those medieval depictions of the colossus of rhodes which was one of the um, miracles seven miracles of the world and his crown it looks like just beams of light sticking from his head to the sides and like crown of the sun during the sun eclipse you can see this crown corona it's called corona because it's latin for the crown and this virus this disgusting virus that we hate we hate it we don't like this virus it was called originally coronavirus because it was like on micro photographs it looked with the spikes kind of like a crown but anyways let me hide this one i don't want it to see but basically coronal section is kind of like these beams that sticking to the sides coronal section goes like that coronal section um, of this giant 
would preserve the crown of this giant because it goes in this direction. And the last one is called sagittal. That's the best way I can explain it. So I go basically when I had to remember that I went by exclusion. Horizontal has sense. Coronal, I remember this weird picture of you know beams sticking from the face. And sagittal is the third one. Okay? This concludes this concludes. Yep, this concludes the lecture about mm, fancy words. Thank you.